Hello YouTube. So following the video I did yesterday on the principles of flag design, I thought it'd be fun to go through some of my favourite flags. So I've put together a top 10, my top 10 favourite flags. Uh, and this shows some of the runners up, flags that I'd considered but that ultimately didn't make it. Clockwise from the top left, that's California, the Nunavut Territory, the Clatsop Tribe, Wales, the Japanese Rising Sun and St. Lucia. Right, let's get on to the top 10. So at number 10, I've put the flag of Qatar. Uh, this is a really interesting flag. I mean, it's a very simple flag, as you can see, just a, a straightforward bicolour flag. But there are lots of interesting things about it. Uh, first of all, it's the only flag, the only national flag in the world where the width is more than double the height. Uh, so it almost uh, looks more like a banner than a, than a normal flag. It's a very, very long flag and quite striking for that reason. Uh, and also it's got this fairly unusual, uh, lovely maroon colour. Uh, it was originally red, but the local dyes used in making the flag darkened in the, um, in the very uh, bright sun. So uh, the official colour was changed to this gorgeous deep maroon. So in addition to any symbolism, the colour is tied to the details of the local fabric industry, which I rather like. And of course, I also love this uh, serration pattern that, that it has. Just a very simple, but I think really beautiful flag. Unfortunately, there is a very similar flag out there, the flag of Bahrain, which is a much less interesting version of the cutter flag. Uh, you can see the color is a more normal red. The serrations are less uh, severe. The aspect ratio is just normal. So it's really, it's got none of the beauty of the cutter flag. So yeah, number 10, the flag of Qatar. All right, number nine, Maryland. I talked about this a little bit in the last video. Just a wonderful design, really, uh, really striking, really unusual with this repetitive pattern plus the fairly unusual color scheme. Um, and you know, it's a very uh, dynamic flag, uh, particularly I think this yellow and black pattern. That's the uh, pattern from the Calvert banner the Calvert family banner. The other pattern is known as the Crossland banner. Anyway, the Calvert pattern, I can imagine that diagonal stripe sort of moving up and down, you know, and below the other two Crossland uh, qu quadrants. So it has real depth and, and dynamics, you know, it, it sort of moves and it feels like the Crossland banner is somehow kind of above the, uh, the Calvert banner. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful design. Apparently this flag has become a little bit controversial in recent years because uh, the Crossland banner is Confederate imagery. Uh, it was used by the Confederate Marylanders in the American Civil War. Um, you know, I, I would just say the meaning of any symbol changes and surely the meaning of the Maryland flag has changed now, right? I mean, people no longer use it as a Confederate symbol. And in any case, I would point out the uh, the Confederates lost, and that is reflected in the flag by giving the Calvert pattern the canton of the flag. Uh, so the, as I mentioned in the last video, the top left part of the flag is, that's, the, that's often considered to be the uh, most important part of the flag because you can still see the top left even when it's not windy, when the flag is hanging limp. So by giving the Calvert pattern the canton, that reflects the, the loss of the Confederate side. So, I mean, this flag sort of represents, I suppose, uh, the, the, the loss of one side and then ultimately the reunification of the state, which seems to me actually perfectly reasonable symbolism. Anyway, Maryland, your flag is great. Please don't change it. Number eight, Libya. I know that this is controversial, this one. This is the, no longer the Libyan flag. This was the Libyan flag from uh, 1977 to 2011, uh, Libya under Gaddafi. And as you can see, it it, uh, it breaks what I suppose is the most basic and unspoken rule of flag design in that it actually doesn't really seem to have any design at all. Uh, um, but you know, I just, I love this flag. When, when Libya adopted this flag, it was the only national flag that consisted of nothing but just a single solid color. It's so, unique and bold and austere. You know, it's almost like the monolith from 2001. 
Um, and I, I particularly love as well that green is, is actually quite an unusual colour for this. We've all seen uh, the, the black flags and red flags of leftist protests and the, the white flags of surrender. So, I mean, there are flags that, that are just blank like this, but it's very unusual for a national flag to be like that. And it's also green is an unusual choice. It's also good for propaganda purposes, incidentally, because if you've got a flag of just one colour, then anything that's made out of that colour can become associated with the flag. So you can sort of start to see the flag everywhere, um, which, as I say, for the purposes of promoting nationalist sentiment uh, is perhaps quite useful. But you know, even though this flag is so, so simple, there's actually a very rich meaning there. First of all, uh, green is the colour of Islam. Libya, of course, is an, is an Islamic country. Uh, secondly, the green references uh, Muammar Gaddafi's green book. His green book laid out the political philosophy of, of Libya. Uh, the colours also reference the, uh, the Fatimid Caliphate and Ottoman Tripolitana. Another point is, uh, and I don't know if this was intentional, uh, but re recall that Gaddafi was a revolutionary, uh, a socialist, um, or at least that's what he claimed to be. Uh, now, as I noted, many socialist protests and movements uh, displayed solid flags, black or red. And so the solid colour of the Libyan flag, to me, it, it hints at Gaddafi's revolutionary ideology. Uh, and, and finally, it also connects to the history of other Islamic countries, because historically, quite a few Islamic countries had plain solid flags. Here are just a few examples. So seen in this context, the Libyan flag can, can it sort of becomes a perhaps a rejection of Western influence, a return to more independence for Islamic nations, a return to their roots. So all of that, all of that is going on in, in this flag, even though it's just a field of green. Incidentally, um, these plain flags, like the Libyan flags, I like to call them Klein flags, after the artist Yves Klein. He was famous for his monochrome paintings, so I call them Klein flags. The new Libyan flag is just really boring. I mean, look at this. It could be any Arabic country. If you, if you look up a list of Arabic flags, the, loads of them have some combination of red, green, black and white. Uh, and, and then there's the, the, the Islamic crescent. I mean, this is just a rubbish flag. Uh, just so, so generic. Look at this. Absolutely striking and gorgeous, immediately eye-catching. Man, I, I, I love that old Libyan flag. OK, number seven, South Carolina. This is another US state flag. Even though most US state flags are awful, uh, two of them make my top 10. So I suppose that the, the US states, they usually do it wrong, but when they do it right, they really knock it out of the park. Man, South Carolina, it's just something about this flag. You know, it's something about the, the blue color. It's actually quite an, un, an odd shade of blue. To me, it's not what you'd immediately think of when you think of blue. It's, it's just slightly off, slightly strange shade of blue. And it's got this palm tree and that, that, that exaggerated crescent moon, pure white against that strange shade of blue. It's so evocative. More than any other flag, it just, I don't know, it just transports you to a, to a place. It's sort of got this mystery and it's, it's evocative. I, I, I love it. Uh, now, the, uh, interestingly, the use of the, the crescent and the palm tree derives from the symbolism of the American Revolution. It references somebody called uh, Colonel William Moultrie, who successfully defended Sullivan's Island from a uh, very powerful British fleet uh, after he constructed a fortress out of palm trees that was strong enough to withstand the British cannon. And the crescent here was used on, on the flag of the army and on their uniforms uh, of, of Moultrie's troops. So, you know, behind this very serene visual imagery. There's there's the chaos and the revolution, and this you know yearning for liberty and all and all of that. So uh, there's there's a real violence behind behind this serene image. It's almost contradictory that in that respect. All right, number six, the Jolly Roger. I mean, who doesn't like the Jolly Roger? Pirate flag, a rebel flag, very intimidating image. This skull and crossbones on the. It's, it's stark, you know, black and white. And especially considering the 
maritime context where this flag would have been flown because very few maritime flags would have just had black and white. I mean, this is like immediately, immediately eye-catching, very unusual in the maritime context. So it's very intimidating flag. Now there are uh, uh, many versions of the Jolly Roger. Some of them use swords instead of bones. Some of them place uh, the swords or bones behind the skull rather than below it. I, I, I personally, I've, I, I mean, I've given the version that I think is probably the best. I think it should be a fairly primitive drawing. Um, I mean, certainly I think it should only use black and white and it should draw the skull and crossbones in a, a, a simple, almost childlike way. I mean, it's, it's pirates, isn't it? You know, you, you, you do it, it it's, it's supposed to be raw. Uh, you know, so you want it to be a fairly simple drawing, and also don't put an eye patch over the skull. That just looks that just looks ridiculous. It looks gimmicky. Yeah, it doesn't look. It, it really loses the intimidation that the flag produces if you put an eye patch over it. Having said that, I mean obviously there can't be exact specifications for a flag like this. It's a it's a pirate flag, so it's obviously not going to have exact specifications. You just you just make it you know on the fly. You just throw it together quickly. So the Jolly Roger. Number five, Seychelles. Just a, just a fantastic flag, isn't it? Striking, eye-catching. You look at any collection of world flags, this one immediately stands out. And yet, it does have quite muted colours. Really lovely colour scheme. I think that if it had very vibrant colours, it would probably be, you know, be too harsh on the eyes. So the striking shapes, with the somewhat more muted colours, just the right combination, I think. The blue uh, symbolises the sky and the sea around Seychelles Island. The yellow symbolises the sun. The red symbolises the people of Seychelles. The, the white symbolises justice and social harmony. And the green is for the land and natural environment. And this ray design is intended to symbolise the country moving towards the future. And I think it succeeds pretty admirably at that. It's an incredibly dynamic flag. You really feel the movement. So, yeah, I, I love this one. Okay, number four, Nepal. I mean, who doesn't love this flag? N Nepal, the, the Nepalese flag, it's gotta be on any top 10. This is just a wonderful flag. Uh, and, yeah, very unique shape. It's the only national flag that uh, isn't either rectangular or square. And of course, this, uh, you know, these sharp triangles, the double pennon shape, perfect for Nepal because it recalls the mountains of the Himalayas. Uh, and it's got this lovely crimson red colour uh, with the, the moon and the sun. Very mysterious, very evocative. Now you might notice I've put uh, the old version as uh, fourth place. There is a newer version of Nepal's flag uh, which removes the faces from the sun and the moon. And the reason they did this was to modernise the flag, which I think, I think it was a mistake. I mean, it's like, look, I mean, if you're going to modernise the flag, make it a rectangle, you know? The fact is, Nepal's flag is not a modern flag, and uh, it, it's all the better for it. Uh, the faces just give it even more character. They make it even more unique. So I think that was a mistake. I mean, obviously, it's still a fantastic flag, even if they, you know, even the modern version would still be in, in my top 10. I, I just love it, but I think they should have kept the faces on the sun and the moon. Okay, number three, the Gadsden flag. Now, I am aware that this is a very controversial flag. Uh, I think the problem is that in the, in the US, it's become associated with the, the Tea Party movement, who, as I understand it, are, are sort of a bunch of hyper-conservative religious lunatics. I, I don't follow US politics that closely, but that's my understanding. Uh, some people, I've, I've also heard it suggested that it, these days it might be used as a, a racist symbol, which is obviously terrible. I would just say, I live in the UK, nobody has the Gadsden flag over here, so uh, I, I guess I can view it from a perspective more detached from the current social context of American politics. Uh, but also, you know, anybody can fly a flag, and the meaning of any flag is always open to change. Uh, I mean, you, you might notice, for instance, that the flag of the Jainist religion, probably one of the most peaceful religions on the planet, still displays a swastika. And why shouldn't they? I mean, that's a symbol that has important meaning for them. 
So why would they let the, the Nazis steal it? So I would say to any genuine libertarians who uh, were who used to be attracted to the Gadsden flag, you know, you should you should keep it. Don't let it be stolen by religious fundamentalist creeps. So anyway, why do I like the flag? Well, first of all, I I, I see it as as symbolising a libertarian and individualist attitude, which is very much in line with my own outlook. Uh, second, I I like the ideals at least of the American Revolution. Or perhaps I should say I like the mythology of the American Revolution. And that, of course, was the, the context in which the flag was designed. This is explicitly a revolutionary flag. Uh, in fact, even long before this particular flag was designed, the rattlesnake uh, had become a symbol of uh, the American colony's rebellion against British control. So it's, you know, it's a revolutionary flag. Um, another thing is that this flag was uh, originally designed as a navy flag and in fact since the early 2000s or so the US Navy Jack has contained quite similar symbolism to the Gadsden flag. Now I've never been involved in the navy in any way whatsoever but I am from a navy family or loads of people on my dad's side were in the navy. Of course that was the British navy rather than the US navy but I just kind of like that connection. It's just an, another nice connection to this to this flag. Most importantly, the flag has an absolutely brilliant, really striking visual design. You know, political movements are often more associated with uh, with red and black. Uh, yellow is quite an unusual choice, I think, for a political movement, but that really emphasizes the association with with liberty. Uh, yellow is the, the color of, of liberalism and the color associated with libertarianism. The flag of course, does break some of the rules of flag design. It's got quite a detailed image of the snake and it's got text. I think though it, it, it just works, it still works. The text is very well integrated into the overall design. And of course it really drives home the message of the flag, the yearning for liberty, the, the revolutionary impulse of this flag. Having that text on there, and especially, this is what I really love about it, is it doesn't have an apostrophe, the word don't. Don't doesn't have an apostrophe. There are some versions of the flag that put the apostrophe in, but it looks better with the apostrophe out. That really just captures the rawness and the urgency of a political movement and of a, of a rebellion. And I would also add, you know, the very fact that it breaks the rules, yet it still succeeds anyway, that, that in itself kind of works as, as a sort of libertarian symbolism, you know, breaking the rules, but still, still working anyway. And of course, snakes are really cool. So there are so many things that I love about this flag. Okay, number two, Northumberland. Man, I just, I love this flag. Very simple design, but so unusual. I don't know of any other flag that has a design quite like this. The shapes here sort of recall the battlements of a castle to me. You know, those, the crenellations on the top of a castle, where it like goes up and then down. Also, it re it's dis designed to resemble the interlocking stones of Hadrian's Wall. So if you imagine it as being made out of uh, like red bricks uh, interlocking with each other. So this represents Northumberland's place on the border. But it is just, man, I, it's just a great flag. It's simple, but really striking. Very vibrant, striking colours on an unusual design. Just perfect for a flag. It looks especially beautiful against the sky, as you can see in these images. I mean, it, it really is eye-catching. It really stands out against, you know, either a grey sky or a clear blue sky. It's those vibrant reds and yellows really make it stand out. So, Northumberland flag, wonderful one there. So now we're moving on to number one. The number one, my number one favourite flag. Here it comes. Flag of the Benin Empire. This is a very polarising flag. A lot of people love it, a lot of people hate it. I am firmly on the love it side. Just, I mean, just look at this flag. Com totally unique design, certainly, and pretty intimidating. I mean, it's a, it's a red field with uh, some dude getting his head cut off. You don't see that on many flags. I should note this is called the flag of the Benin Empire, but more accurately, we should say it's a flag found during an exposition, expedition to the Benin Empire in uh, 1897. Nobody actually knows where this comes from. 
Nobody knows what group used it. Nobody knows what it means. Well, actually, I suppose, <laughs> I suppose the meaning of the flag is, um, to some degree, rather evident. Yes, self-explanatory. But no, I mean, we, we don't know where it comes from. We, we don't really know what it was used for. Only one copy of this flag has ever been found. And I think whoever it was that found the flag didn't really, uh, either didn't bother asking or um, they weren't able to find out what it's all about. Um, but for me, you know, that, that mystery only adds to its appeal. The very fact that we, that we don't know what this is just makes it an even more fascinating artifact. So, yeah, so just a unique design, very unusual, very eye-catching and very mysterious. Uh, I suppose not really much more to say about this flag, but I absolutely love it. So it's my favourite. And that's my top 10 flags. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.